Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. Uh, I'm uh, Andrew Stetner, the a senior fellow at the Century Foundation, uh, and welcome to our event, Raising Incomes in America. Um, first, let me just thank some of you that have helped put together today's event. Uh, Jeff Madrick, the um, director of the Bernard L. Schwartz Rediscovering Government Initiative, um, who is sponsoring today's event as part of the Century Foundation the Cornell Research Academy for Development, Law, and Economics, and the Democracy Collaborative. Thanks very much to the staff here at Spire on uh, this wonderful space uh, for today's discussion, uh, and the Century Foundation staff, especially Mary Alizoni and Amanda Novello, and our former associate, Sam Adler-Bell, who's written a very provocative primer on the issues um, that we're going to be discussing today that's available on our homepage uh, and out in the lobby. Um, we have, in addition to a great uh, audience here, I know there's a large on online audience today, uh, and we uh, encourage you, um, whether you are here or online, to be part of the conversation. Uh, by tweeting uh, at tcf.org and a hashtag raising incomes. And if you are online uh, and have a question, uh, you can put it out uh, uh, that way. Um, so just a slight um, change in our schedule. Uh, Representative Khanna uh, is running a little bit late this morning. So we're going to uh, start uh, our panel discussion. Uh, and when uh, Representative Khanna comes, he'll jump in. Uh, I'm sure with some very provocative uh, thoughts uh, and ideas. Uh, and so to really start uh, today's proceedings, uh, I'm going to ask Jeff Madrick uh, to come up and really tell you, um, you know, why he thinks it's such an important uh, uh, discussion uh, today. Jeff, are you ready to come up? Okay, very good. I will just do some brief housekeeping. We'll wait for Jeff. Um, for the space, the bathrooms are straight in the back, uh, and we do have uh, some light refreshments available that will stay out there the rest of the day. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks. I don't mean to leave you guys out. The audience should know we had a chat before. Great to see you all. <clears throat> uh, RGI, the Rediscovering Government, initiative has been supported by Bernard Schwartz, uh, who's a major Democratic funder, uh, without any obligations or contingencies for seven or eight years now. That is a substantial amount of money. So I want to thank him very much. He's the reason we're able to get together. <clears throat> uh, and I appreciate all of you to be here. I think the one salient fact about the economy, the single most salient fact about the economy, not only in the last few years, but in the last 40 years, is that Americans haven't participated as they once did in economic growth. Now, most of you know that, but I don't know if we know the extent of it. And what disturbs me most is characterized by the 2020-2019 uh, the campaign at the, of the moment and the 2016 presidential campaign. Democratic candidates are now offering proposals right and left to raise incomes in the nation. Didn't happen in 2016. There were some proposals. They were pretty modest, and they were inhibited by uh, uh, constant questions about how we would pay for everything. Now Donald Trump has blown that wide open. The fact of the matter is we needed to spend more money in 2016. I'm not that sure we would have a decent economy now. <clears throat> and I know this sounds sacrilegious. <clears throat> had Hillary Clinton won, because we wouldn't have been spending enough. We wouldn't have had the fiscal, fiscal stimulus we now have. And I, I'm supported in this by uh, Paul Krugman, who called this expansion a Keynesian expansion, not a sugar high, the way Larry Summers characterized it, or even Joe Stiglitz, but a Keynesian stimulus. That means it won't, it might not, it might, doesn't mean it won't go too far, but it does mean that there's so, there was serious undercapacity during the Obama years that we did not take advantage of. And the result was a lack of wage growth. This is not a new thing 
What's most disturbing is it seems that the people who are offering these uh, income plans think it's something new. I'm not sure they think it's something new, but they're certainly motivated by the sense that we really have to do something about what has been a 40-year problem. Now, it, it's been especially disappointing since the, uh, the Great Recession of 2007, 8, and 9. We haven't expanded wages adequately as we might in a recovery from su such a sharp decline. But it's been true since 2000, the year 2000. It's been true since the 1980. It's actually been true since 1973. Wages for middle income, lower income, and poor people have stagnated or declined over this period in real terms. In the meantime, the cost of health and education, which we consider now our middle class necessities, have soared. That's the state of America. Somehow Trump had an instinct. I call it an instinct because I'm sure it was not an analytical decision uh, that something was missing. I don't think he knows how to deal with it either. It's not a tax cut issue. It's surprising how many Democrats think it is. So we're here to, now that we have a bunch of proposals in front of us, we're here to discuss what might be the best of those proposals, and we're here to clarify this uh, this discussion and debate, and we actually have a great, uh, uh, great bunch of participants for you, extremely knowledgeable in their areas, advocates not necessarily only of what they're going to address, but m two or three of the things we're addressing. And uh, we look forward to them. I'm not going to take any more of your time. I was going to read you a bunch of statistics about how poorly incomes have done and wage share has done, and wages as a percentage of corporate profits have done since the 1980 or so. But I doubt this audience needs much of that. Maybe the younger people. Sometimes I think they missed a little bit of important history. So my bottom line is this is a 40-year-old problem. Let's deal with it now. And Andy, am I giving this to you? Thank you all. Appreciate it. So we have organized today's discussion in a way that we hope will be maybe, if it goes right, a more interesting and engaging panel than some things we have here in, in our wonderful city. Uh, we have three great uh, policy experts who will make uh, the case for some of the big ideas to raise incomes in America. Joe Gwinian, the Vice President for Theory, Research, and Policy, and the Executive Director of the Next Systems Project at the Democracy Collaborative. Pavlina Cherneva, uh, an associate professor of economics and the director of the economics pro program at, at the Bard College, and Sharon Parrott, uh, a senior fellow and senior counsel, counsel at the Center of Budget and Policy Priorities. Then we have two wonderful interlocutors, uh, Angela Hanks, uh, the deputy executive director at the Groundwork Collaborative, and Dylan Matthews, uh, senior correspondent at Vox.com. Dylan and Angela, because we thought this is too much an issue, just have one uh, set of questions. We'll ask some probing questions of each of the participants after they make opening remarks. Um, and uh, we'll go into more of a deeper discussion uh, that will include your questions, whether they come online or by writing questions on the note cards you may have picked up on your way in or will be passed around. And then we'll get some closing uh, reflections from Jeff Madrick uh, and Bob Hockett uh, from Cornell, uh, our sponsor today. As a final note, I wanted to say that we do not think of the issues today that will be discussed, uh, refundable tax credits, federal job creation, and worker ownership as a comprehensive list of ideas to raise incomes. For example, our Rediscovering Government Initiative held a session uh, in February on Capitol Hill about, the, about raising the minimum wage to $15, uh, which is not a proposal being discussed today. But we do hope today's discussion is the kind that progressives should be having uh, as their is this growing consensus that economic growth on its own won't raise incomes? And as we think of big ideas, let's ask uh, the challenging questions uh, about their politics and practice that we need to uh, as we look to hopefully a new political day. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dylan uh, to start our program. Uh, 
Uh, thanks so much, Andy, and thank you all for being here. Uh, we have three great panelists, each with a some distinct vision of how to raise incomes and, and really to en enhance worker power and worker share of, of the economy and of economic growth. Um, so I'll turn it over to them. Uh, let's start with Sharon Parrott. Um, if you could sort of outline your vision and, and your view of the best path forward. Great, thanks. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here. I'm going to talk today about why I think expansions in the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit should be important components of any reform agenda that's related to raising incomes, reducing poverty, and expanding opportunity. But I'm also going to talk about why it's only one component of that kind of agenda and some of the issues that can't be solved by refundable credits and these refundable credits alone. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the growing number of proposals um, for really substantial, much larger than we've seen in the past, really su substantial expansions in refundable credits. Um, there are now a number of proposals to expand the EITC, the child tax credit, create new credits that are closely aligned with those credits. Um, this includes multiple um, proposals in Congress, but also candidate proposals as well. Before diving into the specifics of the proposals, I want to talk for a minute about why I think there's been this growing momentum about using these credits as a platform for income, for raising incomes. Um, first, the EITC and the child tax credit already provide substantial benefits to millions of people. So in 2014, they provided $90 billion of refundable benefits to about 29 million households. So it is an attractive platform because it already reaches so many people. Um, the credits have high take-up rates. It's not perfect for sure, but they are relatively high take-up rates for um, programs that are uh, means-tested in some way. Um, they have low administrative costs, and, um, and for households, they have low stigma um, and once a year claiming, um, which makes them relatively easy to access compared to some other kinds of assistance programs. Um, there's a growing, third, there's a growing and strong research base that shows that the credits have, lo have positive longer term impacts on children, um, which I think has helped uh, shore up support for them. And in fact, they have maintained pretty broad public and bipartisan support. There's definitely a difference between Democrats and Republicans about the importance of expansion, but you don't see the kinds of attacks on the credits um, that we've seen, particularly in recent years in some other areas. So let me talk a minute about the, about the expansion proposals. First, I'm not going to name everyone who has one because I will surely miss someone. Um, but in both the House and Senate, a broad set of Democrats have put forward or are co-sponsoring refundable credit expansion proposals um, that are, as I said, quite robust. And there are definitely differences about them, and we could have a whole panel about kind of the differences, but I actually think their similarities are quite striking. So I want to focus on that for a moment. Among the new child tax credit proposals, all make the credit fully refundable and available to the poorest children, um, including families without earnings, so that's a pretty significant change. Um, they all feature a larger maximum credit for, fam for children under the age of six, kind of reflecting um, a growing research consensus on the unique issues related to the impacts of poverty on young children and some of the higher costs and difficulties families with young children face. There are commonalities among the EITC proposals also. They all place a very high priority on expansion among workers without qualifying children. We sometimes shorthand it as childless adults, though many have children, they're just not in their, in their households. And that's with very good reason. This is the lone group that we tax into poverty. About more than five million um, childless workers are now taxed into poverty or deeper into poverty uh, by the tax code. And the credit for them is quite small. It's a maximum of just over $500, completely phases out quite low levels of earnings. And so it's really heartening to see that after many years of focus on families with kids, which is important too, there's really a consensus, at least among these democratic proposals, of the priority of childless workers. Um, but, all the other, but all the EITC proposals also include significant expansions for all or most families with kids, um, including raising that phase-in rate at the, at the low end so that the poorest families with earnings get a boost as well. Um, the similarities don't stop there, they continue into their impacts. All target substantial benefits to the bottom of the income distribution. Um, so ITAP did, um, shout out to them, they have a very good paper that sort of lays out all the different proposals, or at least many of them. And they show that among five different proposals, um, all of them directed between 55 and 75 percent of their benefits to the bottom 40 percent of um, households in terms of in terms of income, that could not be in more stark contrast to the 27, the distribution of the benefits of the 2017 tax law. 
Um, ITEP's analysis also does a really interesting and important analysis around race and ethnicity, showing that unlike the 2017 tax law, these proposals all um, seek to uh, reduce uh, racial and ethnic disparities rather than exacerbate them. And all of the proposals have very significant anti-poverty effects. The center has written extensively on one of the proposals, Working Families Relief Tax Act. It has no good shorthand way of, of using that acronym. Um, it expands both the EITC and the child tax credit. It is a large expansion. It's about $100 billion a year, though is smaller than some of the others that are out there. Overall, um, 46 million households with 114 million people would benefit. Um, it would lift an additional 7 million people out of poverty, including 3 million um, children, and it would reduce poverty for another 22 million people. So again, all of them are large, all of them have very positive distributional impacts, all of them have significant anti-poverty impacts. I just say a note about Puerto Rico, there's growing interest in making sure that the EIT, that, that the federal government participates and expands the nascent EITC in Puerto Rico and expands the child tax credit to U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico, which is a really important, um, a really important policy avenue um, that hopefully will come to fruition. So now let me just say a minute in my, in my very limited time remaining about what refundable credits are not good for. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to tick through a few things um, to just put a marker out there on the kinds of issues that the refundable credits, the EITC and the child tax credit alone can't solve. Um, refundable credits aren't going to be enough for people without jobs, even if we make them fully refundable and available. They're just, I think the likelihood of them being large enough to really support a family is extraordinarily small. And so any agenda also has to deal with the jobs question, subsidized jobs, skills, that whole cluster. Um, the credits are not going to set a reasonable wage floor. And so expansions in the credits really need to be married by effective minimum wage policies. The credits are not well suited to helping families with particular high cost problems. Child care, housing, those are not problems that by themselves are going to be solved by refundable credits. And I could list others, paid family leave, right? So it's important to put these things into context and think about, while today it may not be about comprehensive, I think it is important to be honest about what these proposals can and can't do. Um, and so with that, I'll stop. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. Uh, Pavlina. Hey, hey, Dylan, I think the congressman is going to be coming up in just one minute. Oh, boy. Um, so, um, maybe, Sharon, did you have points you wanted to make, just in a little interstitial that we lost? We can grant you another minute as we wait for him to come upstairs. No, I had actually gotten through my remarks, although I could, you know, I guess the one thing I will say is that there are a lot of design issues that in my five to seven minutes I didn't touch on that are complicated um, and where I think people with the same values come out in different places. And so one thing we can do during Q&A is talk about some of those. Um, but there are lots of tricky questions, um, in part because the tax system is fundamentally an annual tax system and people's needs are fundamentally a monthly set of needs and trying to think about how those can work together without putting lots of people at risk for owing lots of money back is a very interesting sort of policy not to untangle. Absolutely. So uh, I hear the congressman is running actually a couple of minutes late. Um, so uh, if you don't if you don't mind a, a potential uh, Rokana interruption, um, Pavlina, if you if you, <laughs> if you don't mind uh, introducing us to the job guarantee and and some of the sort of structural effects you think that could have in terms of, of boosting worker power and wages. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, the case I'd like to make is for the jobs guarantee. And uh, I just want to say first that the jobs guarantee is not just a jobs subsidy program or public works program. It is uh, a public option for jobs. The job guarantee is an employment insurance program. It's a voluntary program. So whoever, whatever their circumstance, if they are looking for work that is paying living wage levels, this is the the but the federal program that finds the way to supply that opportunity, and we usually pitch it as an opportunity in the public service sector. Um, my basic argument is the following. We cannot raise the beams or the roof unless we have secured the floor and the foundations. And so what the jobs guarantee does, it is establishes 
um, not just an effective minimum wage, but an effective wage benefit package for the entire economy as a whole. Because if there is a public option for jobs that pays the living standard, that is essentially the standard which then the rest of the economy has to match. That becomes the labor standard. Securing the floor immediately lifts uh, many people out of poverty in a direct way by providing the employment opportunities for those who do not have them or for those who have unstable income. It puts pressure on private firms to match that and to they themselves offer wages that are above poverty wages. It is a bubble up policy because when you secure the floor, you are improving drastically the employment conditions and labor conditions for those who have the most precarious employment situations. And the next year, also the people who have the least bargaining power. And so there is this kind of effect of essentially strengthening the floor and starting to raise the foundations. Without tight, tight, full employment policy, all of our uh, well-intended interventions are going to be uh, ineffective or relatively ineffective. And so um, what, what I, I'd like to highlight here is that perhaps one of the most pernicious problems in the labor market that we have is the threat of unemployment. And all sorts of problems stem from that one threat imagined, real, um, uh, that exists there. And so what we have is, uh, you know, we could try to supplement incomes here and there, but we will still have wage theft. We will still have, um, you know, benefit reduction. We will still have, um, you know, discrimination, harassment, the option, the ability to opt out of these punitive employment conditions that exist throughout the economy uh, is a very strong way of supporting incomes and raising income. We essentially, with the jobs guarantee, want to flip the script and say that no person should be working and earning below living wage pay. That that's the standard that we want the entire economy to meet. Uh, we would like to flip the script in terms of how the economy works. Just pause for a second and contemplate how we have accepted this notion that unemployment is normal condition in an economy. That, well, gee golly, we can't do anything about it. When in fact, we can. And it is a problem that can be uh, eradicated in a very direct uh, way. And so why I think this is a, a, a strategic uh, policy proposal um, for this moment is because there are, there are at least three essential um, insecurities, anxieties that I, uh, we can think about. You know, one is the inability to find work. The other one is uh, the, um, the possibility that people are not earning uh, decent wages. And the third is the possibility of losing even that meager income. And these are not bipartisan issues. These are not left or right, radical or conservative. They are human issues. And in that sense, I think not just in terms of strategy, uh, but in terms of re-envisioning where the public purpose goes, where the public, public policy goes, um, this is a strategic uh, policy because it, it completes, in a sense, the uh, Roosevelt Revolution. It essentially secures the first most fundamental uh, right in the Economic Bill of Rights, uh, and that is the right to a job. And it is a feasible policy proposal because the current model is not working, because it is a bankrupt model, it's extremely uh, complicated, difficult, and ineffective to manage poverty. Um, it, uh, uh, the, the, again, the paradigm of unemployment, of, of allowing unemployment to exist, carries enormous human costs. Um, and on top of it, we have urgent tasks ahead of us to solve that have public purpose, not the least of which is addressing climate change. And so all of that takes work, and that work has to be a decent, uh, good wages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pavlina. Um, I see that we, we, we have uh, arrived. What? Oh. Sorry, we're going to have to interrupt your remarks. Sure. So we, we have uh, Congressman Ro Khanna, who has uh, introduced some, some really interesting legislation on both of the topics that the Sharon and Pavlina talked about, both expanding the EITC and offering subsidized uh, 
paid employment, so I'll turn it over to Congressman Khanna. Thank you, Dylan. And uh, I was just talking to Gene Sperling where I get most of my ideas, so I appreciate that. And Pavlina, thank you for uh, your thoughts. I appreciate uh, being at this uh, important conversation and, and uh, conference on stagnation of wages. Let me uh, share my uh, thoughts. I think the bet that President Clinton and Tony Blair made was that as we move through globalization and as we were moving through a technology revolution, that somehow if we just focused and doubled down on innovation, focused and doubled down on the parts of the economy that were going to work, that we would be able to lift millions of people out of poverty around the world, that we would do very well in the United States, and that the, through Pareto optimality, we'd be able to redistribute the gains and have the working class and middle class do well. And that was the prevailing consensus by many in the 1990s, and not, I think, motivated out of bad faith. I mean, for all of the current trend of bashing China or bashing uh, other countries, there was a sense that it's a good thing that millions of people around the world are lifted out of poverty, not a bad thing. The challenge is that many communities and many people felt left out and were left out, that the gains of the economy were far more agglomerated to the top than people anticipated. They were far more concentrated in certain areas than people thought. They were far more inaccessible to large parts of the country and to a large group of individuals. And so the challenge, in my view, if our time remains, how do we, in a technology revolution, and I think is akin to the Industrial Revolution that is transforming every aspect of the economy, how do we make sure that people and places that have been left behind have an economic stake in it? If you look at some very basic facts, the price of things like automobiles and iPhones and televisions have fallen. Actually, they wages, even though real wages have been largely stagnant, the prices of many consumer goods have fallen uh, below the real wages. And so people are able to buy more consumer products. Here's the problem. The price of hospital costs, the price of college, the price of child care, they have skyrocketed well beyond the real wage. So you have had a sense where most people feel, okay, I can maybe own a television set, but I can't send my kid to college. I can't get the same health care. I can't have the same sense of economic opportunity. And as you go into these communities, it's, and here I think is a very important, and then I'll give you my few solutions and want to hear from the experts the rest of the day. But when you go into these communities, I think there is a greater challenge than just focusing on the person who's 55 or 60 and has a stagnant wage. They are not as concerned just about themselves as they are about their kids and their grandkids. It's not just that they're concerned about their economic security. It's the concern that the American dream, the sense that their kids can have an economic opportunity and have upward mobility, is broken. And it's not sufficient to just go and tell them, OK, we're going to make sure you're economically secure. Since when has that been the American dream? We're going to make sure you can get by. We're going to make sure you can make a paycheck. That's not what Trump sold him. Trump sold him. I mean, Trump's message was very simple. You built America. Your grandparents or great-grandparents fought in for this country. Now all these new people have come in. They're doing really well. 
What happened to you? What happened to your dreams? I'm going to make sure we build that America that you built. That was his message. And it's important to understand the resonance and power of that message to be able to contradict that message. I believe fundamentally the Democrats and progressives need to be able to sell the future to these communities and to say that your kids, your communities are going to have more economic opportunity, a better life, more possibility in the 21st century than before. And if we lose that argument, and I say this as one of the biggest proponents of the expansion of the EITC, and I respect a lot of the presidential candidates proposing an expansion of the EITC in many forums. But if we lose the argument on economic aspiration in the 21st century, we lose. We have to convince communities where they're talking about a brain drain, where they're saying our church attendance is going down, we can't afford to live here anymore to have economic opportunity, where people say we don't want a hand up, but we don't want a ticket out. We have to be able to convince them that they're going to have more choice, more possibility, more economic activity in a digital age than they had before. And all of this argument about, you know, does automation take jobs or not take jobs? Is the future going to be good or bad? I said, we don't have a choice. That, let MIT debate that. Let University of Chicago de debate that. Choice is very simple. If you're going to cling to the past as an economic model, you're not going to embrace pluralism. You're not going to embrace most of the values that many of the people in this room believe in. We have to sell and do everything possible to sell people on the future. The technology is actually going to make their lives better. And so I know the EITC and other things are what you're focused on, and I am 100 percent a believer in that because it leads to better outcomes for nutrition. It leads to better outcomes for education. It's going to get people more uh, economic a stake in an economic uh, future. And Neil Irwin and the work we did on our EITC bill, and Kamala Harris is a great bill, and Rashida Tlaib is uh, taking the bill to a new level, talks about how uh, you can, for the amount we spent on the Trump tax cuts, actually compensate people for the stagnation of wages in the past, uh, in the bottom, 20 per, uh, bottom 40 percent for the past 30 years. And we had great work with people like Gene Sperling, who expanded the earned income tax credit in the Clinton administration, and it was a focus in the Obama administration. But it's insufficient. It's insufficient to just focus on that, because it's not aspirational enough. It's not telling people in these communities what's going to bring their communities, their kids, a chance to participate, a chance to dream, a chance to think that they can create wealth in their communities. And I think that my view on that, that challenge is a much harder challenge uh, of how we do these in these small towns and communities and communities of color. Let me leave you with this thought. 6,000 new millionaires are going to be created in my district by Uber. Most of the other communities say, well, the best we can do is have an Uber driver. These 6,000 millionaires are probably not going to be many, I haven't looked at it, but my guess is they're probably not going to be many black Americans who are going to be part of the millionaires of the 6,000 that are created. I was talking to John Lewis. He said, technology rights are the new civil rights. You care about the racial wealth gap in this country, that an African American has seven cents um, to the dollar? Then you should care that the engines of the most extraordinary wealth creation are leaving out whole populations. It's not enough to redistribute post-production. We need to figure out how to democratize the economy pre-production. We need to figure out how to give people more access to the work that's going to give them an opportunity to create wealth. And we need to do that in communities of color. We need to do it in rural America. We need to do it uh, in all of these places that have been left behind and recognize that uh, that was, in my view, the fundamental mistake of our optimism for technology, that it did not create the opportunities in many of these communities. I'm going to have to speak for 10 minutes. I won't get into all my ideas about how we can get the democratization of the technology economy, but I th hope that as you have this conference, uh, you will uh, also address 
those fundamental structural economic reforms that I think are needed to give people more access. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again to, to Congressman Khanna, and uh, that's actually a great transition point because uh, Joe Gwinnian is going to be talking about some ways to structurally change wealth creation, change ownership of wealth, and can change control over, over capital, really, in our economy. So, uh, Joe. Thank you, Dylan, and it's great to be here. Um, and what a great setup when Congressman Khanna says it's not enough um, to redistribute um, pre-production, but what we actually need to do is democratize the economy um, pre-production. Um, and uh, what I want to talk about with my brief time today is the need for a democratic ownership revolution in America. And what I mean by that is the widespread democratization of the ownership of capital so that we widely distribute um, ownership and rights to the returns to capital. Um, and it's, uh, it's very much uh, the, the case that we need to be addressing what Jeff spoke about at the very beginning, which is that this is a 40-year problem. Uh, it's very easy to get distracted by the current occupant in the White House, but it doesn't matter who's in the White House to some degree on some of these deep trends that we're seeing with regard to income inequality, with regard to, to wage stagnation, and certainly with regard to the concentration of wealth. If you actually look at who owns wealth in America, it's astonishing. 400 individuals, you could cram them into this room or on a single airplane, um, own as much wealth um, as the bottom two-thirds of Americans put together. I'd call it a medieval distribution, except medieval historians would correct me and say it was a far more egalitarian distribution back in the Middle Ages. Um, so this is the problem that we have to tackle, and we need to go right to the heart of the, the institutional relationships of the economy that are, are producing these outcomes, whether we have democratic control of the White House and the Congress or, or not. Um, and what I think we need to be moving in the direction of is essentially uh, plural forms of collective and broad-based ownership of capital and assets, um, which can take many forms. I think there should, there's a strong role for, for public ownership and for municipal enterprise. Um, there's collective capital ownership that can take the forms of public trusts or, um, or pay out dividends like the Alaska Permanent Fund, which can get to some of the, uh, the inequality issues we've been talking about. But there's also um, the opportunity to really democratize um, at the heart of the economy and enterprise um, in the workplace. And so I'm going to use the rest of my time really to, um, to talk about worker ownership and the, the prospects there. We face a huge opportunity um, looking forward in what's being termed the silver tsunami. Um, which is that there is a massive wave of retirement coming up of baby boomer business owners who have created the kinds of small and medium enterprises that really ought to be the lifeblood of this economy and of, of Main Street. And many of those businesses are going to be facing a massive succession problem. Um, often there aren't children ready to take over. There may not be people ready to purchase those businesses. Waiting in the wings is private equity, um, ready to asset strip and throw away the carcass of many of them. And so what we ought to do is seize this opportunity to really bring about a massive expansion of, of worker ownership um, so that people can actually benefit directly from the ownership and control of, of capital. Uh, Congressman Kanna talked um, about economic aspiration. What greater uh, aspiration could there be than ownership of your own job, ownership of your own company, of your own economic destiny in that form? And so we should be bringing about this transformation, I think, from both the bottom up um, and the top down. Um, there are, there's already um, a very large base to build on. There's something like 11,000 worker-owned firms if you combine uh, employee stock ownership plans and worker cooperatives um, uh, in, this, in this country. That's uh, more people that are uh, worker owners in America today than are members of unions in the private sector. So when we're thinking about the institutional basis for, for the next politics, this could be, could be very important. Um, we could be bringing about um, conversions of these businesses by looking at some of the uh, public programs that are available in support of small and medium enterprises, which uh, often it's the case that co-ops or uh, other forms of worker ownership could, could fit with them. And so there's tweaking that we can be done with, uh, with existing programs. Legislation has already gone through this Congress and been signed by this President in support of new technical assist assistance and capacity building um, through employee ownership centers um, that will be created. And so there's a lot that we can do in that regard. 
Um, there's also some very innovative uh, models being developed for support for worker ownership using public procurement and the procurement of large nonprofit institutions, uh, anchor institutions as we call them. Um, and our own work in Cleveland, Ohio is one of the principal models whereby we're using the hospital systems uh, and the university there um, to redirect their, their procurement, three billion a year in, in spending in that city that's suffered deindustrialization and disinvestment. Uh, and actually putting it in support of a network of worker co-ops that are linked to the community and that are providing um, goods and services that are needed by those institutions and good green jobs that are owned by, uh, by the owners and workers in, in those companies. So there's a lot that can be done from the bottom up. But we also need to move to scale very quickly. And it's very interesting to see uh, the reemergence of some old ideas um, on the left about um, how to bring about uh, large-scale conversion to worker ownership. Some of you will remember um, the debates that took place in Sweden uh, in the 1970s and 1980s around what was called the Meidner Plan, which was developed by Rudolf Meidner, um, the chief economist at the trade union uh, federation there, which was essentially to create a share levy um, that would dilute the existing ownership over time and put into trust uh, that would be collectively held by the workers, the unions, and other stakeholders, uh, the ownership of, of private enterprise. And, of course, there was a massive backlash against the Meidner Plan, which would essentially have moved Sweden from a social democratic economy to a democratic socialist economy over a number of decades because there was no ceiling on, on what Meidner was proposing. What we've actually seen is the reemergence of this proposal across the pond in the United Kingdom uh, under the banner of Corbynomics and the, the work that's being done to develop a, a radical policy agenda by Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell over there. And he's announced what's been called the inclusive ownership funds. And the idea there is to take every company above a certain size and mandate um, a share issuance that would dilute existing holdings um, each year uh, of 1% um, up to um, a ceiling of, of 10%, um, which would give the owners, uh, the worker owners of that company then a 10% ownership stake in, in that company. We've seen that idea come back over the pond here um, and being picked up by Bernie Sanders, who is actually um, going to be giving a speech later today um, on what democratic socialism is, and it'll be interesting to see whether the inclusive ownership funds um, proposal um, is, is part of what he talks about there. But these very large-scale possibilities are the kinds of responses that we need that are commensurate with the scale of, of the challenge. If we really start to, to disperse capital and the ownership of assets in the economy in a different way, um, we will have a different basis to actually do some of the progressive policies that I think that we really need, and we won't always be working quite against the grain um, that we have been of the last 40 years. Thank you. Okay, so Dylan and I are going to give uh, a very quick one to two minute uh, uh, kind of opening thoughts and then we'll move right into to questions. Uh, so uh, good morning. My name is Angela Hanksa. I'm Deputy Executive Director at the Groundwork Collaborative. We are uh, a new initiative dedicated to advancing a uh, coherent, compelling, um, uh, progressive economic narrative and worldview. Um, so this is a great conversation. I think a lot of the things that we're thinking about really deeply have come up uh, in, in the opening remarks. Um, but I wanted to sort of plus up a couple of things that I've heard that I would like to uh, spend a little bit of time discussing during, uh, during the Q&A. Uh, so I think it's, it is really important to think about uh, the last 40 years, and I think the, the framing paper that came out uh, ahead of this panel did a really useful job of thinking about um, uh, some of the erosions that we've seen uh, in the labor market for workers um, in the last four decades. Um, I, I would add to that, I think it's the f last 40 years and uh, for many workers, um, there hasn't been a lot of change um, from before that, uh, right? Like. Uh, for uh, marginalized workers, for black workers, for people with disabilities, for immigrants, um, there's never really been like a good labor market. Even at uh, even at the best uh, of times, uh, we still have a lot of a lot of weaknesses. So as we're thinking about policies for the future, we really need to keep in mind that we've never actually had a truly inclusive uh, labor market that benefits everyone. Uh, so I'll, I'll put that on the table. I think related to that, we talked about uh, wealth inequality. Um, certainly, income raising incomes is an important issue, but across the income distribution, there is really massive racial wealth inequality. Um, so I think it's important to, to adopt a both-end approach. Um, and and the, the last thing I'll say, um, I, I'm really interested to talk to these panelists about sort of addressing the big structural issues. I think scale is really the big um, kind of pressing question in my mind. Um, we're talking about all of these fundamental problems with the labor market, um, and, and I think it's really important to, to really consider, um, are we thinking about this at the appropriate scale? Are we um, 
putting solutions on the table that really address those deep structural problems um, and uh, are we able uh, to you know, I think we really do have a lot of the solutions here, but are we really able to tell um, a, a story about how all these things truly fit together? I think Sharon made a really great point in the beginning that these proposals are not um, like the sole things that will fix the labor market for all workers, but um, but we know we know a lot of the things that will, and and do we have sort of the uh, ability to get there? Is, is my question. Uh, thanks so much, Angela. Um, I, I also like this array of, uh, of proposals because they seem to attack sort of three different perspectives on, on the income problem. So, so Sharon's uh, overview gets at some of the deficiencies in the safety net and, and the role of the government as, as a redistributive agency, as, uh, as a spender. Uh, Pavlina takes a, a macroeconomic perspective um, of, of the whole labor market, and, and I think Joe raises some really important questions about ownership of capital and and whether we necessarily need to be thinking of this even as, as raising the labor share if there's a way to have broader capital ownership, broader investment in, in your own capital, in your own workplace. Um, I think I, I agree with everything Angela said about, um, about remembering that there's never been a really great labor market for, uh, uh, for some marginalized communities. I think one question I have with a lot of these is uh, how they interact with, with an immigrant workforce. That I think we've, we've been seeing a lot of welfare chauvinism um, in recent years, uh, and I, I think the, the recent elections in Denmark are, are a, a somewhat depressing sort of warning of what can happen when a social democratic party buys into really anti-immigrant re rhetoric. And so one worry I have, especially with, with things um, mandating uh, government spending or, or even mandating ownership is uh, are immigrant workers going to have a stake in their company? Are they going to have uh, an option to join the job guarantee? Are they going to have access to, to some of these refundable credits? Um, since that specifically in the TCJA fight was, was something that Republicans pushed back against uh, profoundly. Um, but beyond that, I think, uh, I know this is a sort of both and discussion and not an either or discussion, um, but the main question I'm left with is my memory of 2009 to 2010 was uh, the Democratic majorities were able to get about three things done. That they were able to get the stimulus done, they were able to get the health care bill done, they were able to get Dodd-Frank done. And the stimulus in Dodd-Frank seemed somewhat sui generis and not really replicable. Um, you could tell a similar story for 93, 94. Um, Carter didn't really get anything done in 77, 78. And so, I think we're having we're going to have some hard prioritization discussions coming, um, and so I'm I'm curious how people think about combining these and and matching them as an agenda that can get through in the limited time that a progressive majority might be able to to push ambitious policies. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Angela, um, and we're each going to, to ask a question of our our, uh, our panelists, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q and A. Uh, I'll start with uh, Sharon. Uh, so Sharon, you mentioned in your opening remarks um, that there are a bunch of new policies uh, on the table to expand the EITC and the CTC. Um, so I'm just uh, kind of curious of the, of the policies that you've looked at, um, do you feel like we're sort of getting uh, to a point where we're at the appropriate scale? Are there things that are missing that you'd really like to see? Um, do you think there are other opportunities to Dylan's point to marry? Um, some other policies as we're moving these forward, like as a package together. Thanks. So one thing to say is that they're all they're all very large in terms of the scale that we generally do policy making on, right? As opposed to other scales that are you know maybe better scales, right? Like scales of our imagination of of what we what we perceive as need. Um, the scale here, you know at um, it's not every day that you work on low-income policy uh, problems and something that merely costs a hundred billion dollars a year is viewed as like on the low end, right? Um, so that's, you know, so, so I think we are at a scale that may well be more than to Dylan's point, um, a new president even with both houses of Congress in a ch very changed political environment may be able to proceed on. I mean, that's, I think, you know, 
so, so we can talk about what the right scale is in the sort of what we need context. And then there's like, what's the scale we think we can pass? And I think this prioritization question is really important and hard because there are these other things that are really important to do. Um, closing the insurance gap, whatever policy proposal you particularly favor, right, will take some amount of resources. I think where it's pretty clear um, that getting the next tranche of reduction in uninsured is gonna take resources. Same thing with childcare, same thing with affordable housing. So I think we are at a scale with the range of these proposals that are um, as large or possibly larger than the political reality will bear, even in a much better federal policymaking environment that we are likely, you know, that, that we can think about maybe seeing in a 2020 <laughs> Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I think that's sort of where we are. What I am heartened by is the fact that even among proposals that have different scales, that I feel like the prioritization question within refundable credits, as opposed to across all the issues, we are seeing um, some coalescing around. And I think that they are coalescing in, in quite good direction. So I think, um, I think making the child credit fully refundable, I think making sure that whatever scale we are able to pass is largely concentrated in the bottom 40% of the income distribution. And I think really thinking hard about workers without qualifying children, um, and I would add Puerto Rico to that, is the right constellation of priorities. Um, the nice thing about refundable credits, um, there are many things that aren't perfect about them. One thing is that they are scalable, so you can sort of uh, try to push the political envelope on scale, but if you have some coalition, co coalescing around priorities, you can sort of fit within that. Um, but I think that just to think about this question of prioritization across areas, I mean, I do think um, one way to think about uh, the first Clinton budget is it got one thing done, it passed the Clinton budget in 93. The other is to recognize it was a reconciliation dip bill that did like six things. Now, they were not six enormous things, like, right? Like, they were not <laughs> six enormous things. But it was, um, and so I think it's really important to think about that first budget, to think about what you can do within reconciliation, and to identify the places where you want to make progress. And I think there will be this trade off of do I make somewhat more incremental progress across several, across several areas to create some forward momentum? get some wins and recognize that we have a myriad of issues out there? Or do you put all your eggs in one basket or one or two baskets? And, and that is a hard political question. Um, it feels like um, it will be a really important political question. And yet right now I feel like the moment is one of identifying what are those most important things? How can we move forward on them in responsible ways? And remember to not put the cart before the horse of prioritization So I had a, a, a more um, policy design question than a, than a political question. Um, so one interesting direction that I've seen a lot of EITC proposals go in is in expanding our notion of what work is. So uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman and, and Glenn Moore have been doing this in some of their bills. But the idea of the caregiving and being uh, a, a stay-at-home mother, caretaker to a disabled family member, an elderly family member, could count as work and be compensated through a safety net that's sort of designed around supplementing work. Um, I'm curious uh, what you make of those proposals, how you think they could be implemented, and, and if it's possible to bring that perspective into to the EITC structure. Thanks, so that this is one of the myriad of these sort of design structural questions that I think are really interesting and important to sort through. Let me start at the level of values. So I think it's I think that people who are um, who are thinking about this caretaker issue, um, and there's also people thinking about the student issue. But let's just stay with caretakers so we don't get ourselves completely down a rabbit hole. Um, it, as we think about this caretaker issue, I think there's no question that people have identified an enormously important group of people in the country who often. Um, have lower labor market earnings. They may have no labor market earnings, so they may have lower labor market earnings because of their caretaking responsibilities. Um, and they may face actual costs, right, associated with in-home care and things like that, um, that when they are paying to supplement their own caretaking. So I think at the level of values, this is an enormously important area. 
um, and one that's been overlooked in policy for a really long time. Um, as underfunded as our child care system is, um, the idea of thinking about not only older kids, but older relatives and people with disabilities in that context has been very slow in coming. I think the question is then, like, what's the right policy response? Um, so I think thinking about the credits is an important thing. I think um, there are different ways to think about it. Um, I think there's been a lot of attention on the earned income tax credit. I think there is a question of whether it matches better to a fully refundable child tax credit um, as a way of thinking about lining up kind of values and kind of the implementation piece. But I will say that implementation piece is important, and I know that um, uh, thinking about all the ways that things uh, are hard to implement can be frustrating when we're trying to think about what the right policy direction is. And yet, I think for refundable tax credits, what's, what can be implemented in a way that doesn't drive up error rates and create risks for the entire set of credits is, is something we have to do as responsible stewards of these policies that help millions of people. And so the challenge of how do you map on um, care, caretaking is it only people in your household? Is it people that are also outside of your household? As someone who has done a lot of caretaking recently for an elderly person that did not live in our household, those are complicated questions. And how you do that in a way that doesn't make things very error prone is hard. It is actually one of the reasons why I think thinking about it in the child tax credit component might be a little bit easier um, and get you very to a similar place. So I think it is the right set of questions to answer. I do think the implementation piece is hard. Uh, Pavlina, so um, you mentioned in your, your uh, remarks in the beginning that um, many of the benefits of the job guarantee are that um, they sort of uh, help provide an alternative to a workplace that is, frankly, like exploitative across the board, which I think is right, right? Like you talked about wage theft, um, I think sexual harassment, paying poverty wages, um, racism, discrimination, all of those things exist in our current labor market. and experience them. Um, so so in, in thinking about um, providing a, a job guarantee as an alternative, um, are, there, are there specific elements or, or ways to sort of address those issues both in the public sphere but also um, not just as a public option but, but sort of addressing those problems in the private sector market because there, there are likely to be workers who, who remain in the private sector who are subject to all of those conditions. Um, and so are there, are there ways you're thinking about um, sort of the set of policies that need to be a part of the public option uh, to provide a, a, a decent alternative and then um, ways to sort of tame the, the um, really egregious abuse that we see in the private sector? Yes, thank you, uh, Angela, for the question. Um, so. The first thing I need to say is that uh, the job guarantee is not a panacea to all labor market problems. Um, and there are many important interventions to address some of these uh, issues of discrimination that you know, need to be beefed up, no doubt. Um, but there is another element to this, that they um, are, again, not going to be terribly effective, or completely effective, I want to say, unless a person also has the choice to opt out of those um, punitive arrangements or opt in to some sort of you know, decent job option. So let me give an example. Ban the box for former inmates. I mean, it's a really good movement. Like, we need to have that. But on the other hand, if, if, a, if a person is not able to transition you know, uh, into civil society and look for work, uh, the ban the box is not going to really help them if we still have the option of unemployment because of the way employers hire and the way the experience that a person um, may not have built because they have had, you know, they, they've been in the criminal justice system or whatever. So, you know, these are people that experience so many multiple kinds of uh, deprivations and problems in the labor market that unless you have that employment saf safety net to help address and allow them to transition to private employment, it's, uh, we're not going to be able to be terribly effective. Um, we, we have to be able to allow people to say no to punitive arrangements. You know, if you're harassed mercilessly because you're holding on to that second week of vacation that the private job uh, is going to give you in a little bit, uh, you know, we just can establish a standard and say, look, two week pay of vacation for full time, whatever the, whatever the, ba the package is. Then there's another, there's another kind of issue um, that the job guarantee brings to the table, that we are rethinking 
uh, how work should be done, that we, the job guarantee has the worker in mind. The job guarantee creates employment opportunity commensurate with their skill, situation, conditions. It totally flips the script from the way the private sector works. You fit the worker to the private sector job, while in this case we, we fit the job to the person who's seeking the job. And also the job is a, uh, it's not really a, a job, it is a public purpose employment opportunity. So to have a, an entire structural intervention in the labor market that says that we value work that is based on public purpose uh, criteria and on human criteria changes the way even the private sector starts to think about what they do for their workers, how they treat them, uh, what kind of work environment uh, exists in the private sector. So my, my big question around a, a, a job guarantee um, is how it would interact with our existing sort of inadequate uh, systems for getting toward full employment. So currently, I think if you ask most think tankers around DC, how do we get to full employment, they'd say you, you set, the Fed sets interest rates at a point that, that maximizes employment and minimizes inflation. And I know you have a different theory for how uh, a job guarantee can uh, fill that role, can control inflation. Um, I'm curious if you could lay that out for us and why this is a better way to handle the labor market than leaving it up to the Fed. Okay, um, thank you, Dylan. So I want to say something a little bit about the Fed and about fiscal policies. The, the Federal Reserve has one important tool, one, <laughs> one tool to manage many, many problems in the economy. That is the interest rate tool. And so um, uh, we, we have discretionary fine tuning by raising, lowering interest rates in hope that that delivers great many benefits to the economy. But the benchmark of analysis there is that we still cannot create uh, jobs for all, and there will be some natural level of unemployment. And in fact, uh, you, know, you could hear these statements from the Federal Reserve that we need to know the natural level, the natural level of unemployment. So we operate on a paradigm where millions of people are required for the stability of the system. If that pool is too small, we might, God forbid, see inflation. If that pool is too large, you know, people might, you know, lose their incomes. And so there is, in our, in our paradigm, there is this notion that millions of people are necessary to maintain inflation or macroeconomic stability. And that is, I, I call it, you know, it's a morally bankrupt pa uh, paradigm, but also economically bankrupt because we have an alternative. Um, the jobs program uh, will have some sort of cyclical effects because that's how the private sector moves. It lays off people, hires them, lays off people, rehires them. But the jobs program is the employment safety net. You may choose to uh, take up unemployment insurance, but when it runs out, what do you do? Uh, you could go into this employment option, employment insurance program. And in times of recessions when private firms lay off en masse, they, that captures these people who need work. And when the economy recovers, they transition out. And so, uh, so there will be some counter-cyclical effect that is far better than the counter-cyclical effect of having uh, unemployment change dramatically. Just look up the unemployment rate, how it behaves in the U US. It's like a human yo-yo. It shoots up in recessions and then slowly recovers in expansions. We want to get rid of that. And once you provide employment opportunities, you actually stabilize your economy and these amplitudes soften up. That is on the Federal Reserve side. On the fiscal side, we have still this idea, this notion that as long as we crank growth, that will create jobs. And it is a form of trickle-down economics because when we crank growth by conventional means, we improve the employment conditions of people who already have jobs, you know, who already are employed, employable, whatever that means in the eyes of the employer, people who have tenure and inexperience, and people who have gaps, big gaps in their resume, the, one, the last ones to be hired. So we can crank growth as much as we want through various means, but the shortest distance between two points is a direct line. Just give jobs to the unemployed, and then we know that fiscal policy has done its job. 
let's have a wage-led kind of recovery and growth by directly providing the employment opportunities rather than provide investment subsidies, contracts, various other things, and we pray and hope that they will trickle down in the form of jobs. It flips fiscal policy as well. Uh, so, so, Joe, um, uh, in, in the beginning of your remarks when you were talking about sort of the, the last 40 years and some of the, the, the kind of growth and inequality that we've seen over this time, I mean, I think a lot of panels got to, got to this idea um, that, you know, we, we haven't gotten here by accident. This is um, because workers fundamentally have a lack of power and those at the top um, have been able to sort of shape the labor market in a way that benefits them and, and makes it harder for the, for the rest of us. So, so I'm, I'm curious, um, could you talk a little bit about sort of the, how uh, democratic ownership flips, flips the power dynamic and then how it also interacts with some of the, um, I think, more traditional power building models that we see in the U.S., like uh, unions, uh, uh, for example? Absolutely. Um, and I think that's, that's the critical question in terms of institutional power. Um, we've essentially had um, countervailing power in the economy through the power of the unions. Um, it was never as high here as it was historically in um, European um, social democracies, um, but we did get to a decent chunk of the labor force um, in the immediate post-war period, and then that's down, as I think I mentioned, to 6% now in the, in, in, the, uh, in the private sector, and that's not enough power to push back through policy and politics uh, in order to uh, get the regulatory environment, the kind of policies that we need to underpin um, the kind of um, labor force that would actually deliver for, for ordinary working people. And so by actually going um, to those core institutional relationships of who owns and controls capital, what's the relationship to, um, to investment um, and to capital markets, um, and reconfiguring those in ways in which we've got much greater collective um, control, be it through public enterprise and outright public ownership, through rooted community ownership, um, where there's um, a lot more control over what happens to the economy of your local community and you're not engaged in the kind of smokestack chasing uh, local economic development policies where we're throwing the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars in subsidies at, at companies to try and attract uh, new jobs to our community that are actually just old jobs that were somewhere else and we play this zero-sum game out over and over again. And so what we can do through some of these strategies that we're proposing is actually break that cycle and recognize that there is still public power. Um, uh, and a lot of it is at the local level. Um, and that's why some of these anchor procurement strategies are really important, I think, in laying a foundation for building new worker co-ops that are then, in some senses, in a protected market, um, in that they know that they can expect contracts because there's a specific effort on the part of the, the city, on the part of the anchors, to, to, to build this ecosystem of of jobs and root them in place. And it's a re-embedding of the economy back in community and a kind of moving out of, uh, of, of the sort of the power of, of corporations to exert locational blackmail. And I think this starts to, to get at some of these power issues and dynamics. What we also need is an offensive strategy. In some ways, these are defensive moves still operating within the current system. We actually need to be looking at how we change some of those um, fundamental patterns in, in the system as a whole, and that's where some of the large-scale interventions, like thinking about a share levy, um, uh, really begin to matter and would have purchase. And people might throw up their hands and say this is horrible socialism, but it already happens. It just happens for the top five executives in companies. We're already diluting um, share value on a regular basis to give share options to, to some of the wealthiest people in the country. So um, these types of proposals uh, would actually broaden the basis of, of those types of benefits. And so on the one hand, it might look like a scary agenda for radical economic transformation. On the other, it's just a common sense response, I think, to good core for governance and some of the things that we need to rebalance the economy away from short-termism. It could be both. So I have a, a sort of wonky design question for you, Joe. <laughs> uh -oh. um, so, so one thing that was interesting to me about the Meidner plan in, in Sweden was that it was an economy-wide thing, that you had this national fund that was funded by workers that was going to be buying up sort of the commanding heights of the Swedish economy. And the Corbyn plan that the John McDonald's laid out is more uh, I don't know, artisanal, that you're buying up shares in your company, you're, you're buying up a, a stake in your workplace. And that design is, is, is interesting to me, especially since we have a bunch of evidence that inequality between firms has been increasing, that you have people doing similar jobs, but some firms have really high rents, 
if you're doing payroll management at Google, you're maybe making a lot more money than if you're doing payroll management at the hospital. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about how that plays into the design of your proposal and whether it should happen at the firm level or at the economy level, whether we should be sharing those rents between more and less successful firms. It's a really good question. I could talk at length about some of the intricacies of the Meidner plan and exactly why it was designed in that way, but it's undeniable that, um, that it suffered a political economy problem in terms of support. Um, they were contending with things like ABBA holding rock concerts for young people to, prote to protest against the idea of the wage earner funds as they were being proposed and uh, business mobilized in a way that um, hadn't been seen and outspent all the parties collectively in Sweden um, by an order of magnitude um, in that election. And then you got the, the, the first loss of the Social Democrats in, in a long time, largely thanks to the wage earner funds. And the problem with the design of the wage earner funds in Sweden was uh, exactly what you were getting at, which was the, the this was going to be a share levy that was put into regional funds, I think was the design that they actually came out with. But in a way, you broke the link um, between the immediate stake in the, in the workplace. I think there, there would be an initial ability to vote vote your shares, uh, which were non-transferable, by the way, so you're kind of keeping this collective capital over time. It's not a tax. You're not withdrawing anything from the company. You're just diluting and, and transferring ownership. But the, the, this was seen in some ways as a union power grab um, because it would operate at the regional level in terms of governance. What, what the Corbyn proposal is doing is operating at the level of the firm. Um, and giving, uh, again, with non-transferable shares, shares that would go into a trust, uh, workers uh, a control um, in the governance and the decision-making within their own enterprise. Now, there's a couple of ways that um, the proposal um, does and could address the inequality between firms uh, aspect. Um, so on the one hand, um, there's a cap on the dividend that's paid out. And this is something, again, that was different from the Meidner proposal in Sweden. You weren't getting anything direct, whereas I think people have looked back at Thatcherism and neoliberalism and seen the big plays that they made with things like the right to buy, which gave people their council houses in the UK for 50% of the value, and suddenly you had a property-owning democracy and a lot more Tory voters, right? So we've learned the lesson of that, and there's a direct stake that's being created from these, um, from these funds that would pay out a dividend up to a certain amount. The proposal on the table in the UK is 500 pounds. I think it should actually be higher than that. It should probably be 1,000, 2,000 pounds, but something significant, a little like the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend that was very, very popular and important um, uh, in Alaska. The other um, thing is what you do um, with, um, with the returns above uh, that cap. And at the moment, um, the proposal that, that the UK Labour Party has is to just take that, those funds and put them into the Treasury. I think that's probably a political mistake. I think what they should do is actually put it into a sovereign wealth fund um, that would actually do some of the, the, in its activities and operations, whether that was a dividend to non-workers or others, um, or investment in things that people need, uh, a way of actually redistributing. So you get, you know, the differences between the people that work for the garbage truck company and the people that work for Google or the oil industry or whatever, and you can start to, to redistribute in that way. We'll see what happens um, over here as these proposals um, uh, uh, develop. The, the public opinion is, is pretty clear on this. We've done some polling um, at, at the Democracy Collaborative, uh, and there's also been polling done um, also by YouGov in the UK. People like the link, the direct link, um, and the dividend um, from, from this, and there's very large levels of support on a bipartisan basis for, the, for these ideas. Once you start putting the money into, into social spending, unfortunately, um, there's a drop off of something like 20% in support. So that's going to be part of how we think about the design of these things for political sustainability. Um, so now we'd like to, to have a little bit of discussion between our panelists, um, since these are sort of self-contained proposals, but they interact in really interesting ways. Um, so Sharon, I, I was curious how, since I know the, the center has been interested in, in job guarantee policies as well, how you see EITC and, and wage subsidies in general interacting with, with ideas like Pavlina's um, and, and whether you can, could set up a mixed system where you're both directly providing jobs and, and subsidizing private employment. Sure. So, um, yeah, the center has been interested in subsidized jobs proposals. Um, and thinking about how they can fit together. I think um, the center generally uh, is more concerned than some of the job guarantee proponents about the scale and what happens to the labor market um, 
particularly in communities where the prevailing wage is lower and how much can you bid that up safely versus not. But I think that the policies can fit together, subsidized jobs and, and, and things like the earning income credit can fit together well in the sense that we think there's very much a role for, um, for public jobs or subsidized jobs or however you want to call it, um, both because of both because of the question of whether they can improve private sector job outcomes, though the evidence on that is pretty mixed, but because there's, um, there are groups of people who even in a strong economy and certainly in a weak economy don't find jobs. And whether you attribute that to market failure or any number of things, that's a huge problem. And so creating subsidized jobs but recognizing that people's earnings from both those subsidized jobs and private jobs are still, for a large swath of workers, unlikely to be enough uh, to support families at a level that we think is acceptable in the country. Um, I think that, that what is effectively a wage subsidy can, can, um, can kind of complement that kind of a strategy. Uh, Pavlina, how do you see these fitting together? Okay, so um, the job guarantee is situated within a broader progressive agenda of strengthening incomes for all, working and non-working um, families and individuals. And so I often talk about, um, you know, the important components for caregivers, for students, for people with disabilities. Um, and so in that sense, I think that the greatest complementarities I see with, for example, uh, the child uh, credit policies, my preference would be something like a universal child allowance. Um, but there are also a lot of federal programs. Well, there are some, not a lot. There are some federal programs that already provide support, for example, to veterans. There are caregivers of veterans that are receiving uh, federal money to take care of their, you know, uh, disabled veterans, et cetera. And so that could be a model of where we, again, expand the definition of work and use some combination of income support and um, job guarantee. Um, with respect to private sector subsidy, uh, wage subsidy, I see this more of as, a, as an industrial strategy. Like, you know, we want to support certain sectors. We want to reduce the costs and the labor costs, the significant costs for certain sectors. And so we want to encourage those investments in the private sector. So to me, that, that makes uh, sense. Um, where I think there may be some differences here is that um, uh, uh, earning income tax credit and various other subsidies in the private sector without the job guarantee actually do represent kind of a, a wage subsidy that, that the net employment effects of those are quite ambiguous. And we still have all the other problems associated. Just as Sharon said, you know, like the earned income tax credit doesn't deal with people who don't have employment. And also there are some, some issues of design of how you actually provide um, the, the support at the end of the year rather than on some sort of ongoing basis. But from the point of view of the employer, you know, we see situations like, you know, uh, Walmart where it's a giant employer, but, you know, so many of their workers are on food stamps on various other um, income support programs. And so the way I tend to see it is that, that um, the welfare uh, safety net is the morally right thing to do. Um, it is, we, we re-envisioned the welfare state in the, in the 30s. Uh, we went big, we went bold. I think the transformation from our vantage point is easy to underestimate. Even what we're talking about here, I don't believe we're talking about as, as bold in terms of scale policies that we should be going forward. We, in a, in a matter of two years, we, do, we did minimum wages, 40 hour work week, we, you know, we, uh, uh, we allowed workers to, to uh, unionize, we, we did social security, we, uh, we did so much. And so in some sense, we have, despite the erosion of the institutional structure over the last 40 years, we already have some very good foundation upon which to build. And we are, in my view, engaged in another moment of rethinking the welfare state and where does that take us forward and what must we demand. And so in terms of just to link back to the political strategies questions, I think that uh, we, I don't think that we should be, uh, you know, we, we should triangulate and try to figure out what, what goes best first. I think we need to go bold, big, and we, you know, propose what we believe must be done, and a, a moment then uh, will appear uh, where these things will uh, probably see the light of day. In, in 
I'm curious to hear both Pavlina and Joe on, on how they see their proposals interacting, because one thing Pavlina's proposal does, especially in downturns, is pull more people into a public sector labor force. And so um, that's a crucial safety net. It's, it's way better than unemployment. Um, but it does mean fewer people in the kind of arrangements that Joe's talking about gaining um, sort of dividends from private sector work. Um, is that something either of you worry about, or do you see them as complementary? I see them as complementary, and actually, I'll let Pavlina talk about that if she want, this if she wants to. She's done some of the most creative thinking, I think, around designs for how to actually do a job guarantee. And if you think about a, a sort of a new set of plural ownership forms and enterprises at the community level, some of them might be publicly owned but, but run by the community, et cetera. As I understand some of your thinking, there are ways to decentralize the actual creation of the jobs in a way that isn't just a scary big federal program expecting uh, people here in Washington to understand what's needed um, down at the community level, but that I, they could actually intersect pretty well. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's a really rich vein to, uh, to explore and pursue. Yeah, no, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, what are the kinds of jobs that we will do in the job guarantee? I mean, we can just unleash our imagination because the public purpose has been underserved for such a long time. And so you could think of the more conventional things like public works, et cetera. We have a whole Green New Deal to, de to deal with like, going forward. We need to bring that back into the conversation. But part of the public purpose is the neglect exactly of the person in the working uh, space, in, the, in, their, in their working life. And so uh, cooperatives uh, are part of the proposal, the job guarantee. I, uh, I do see the, um, this policy kind of providing seed funding for people who can then do these uh, various, uh, whether they're worker centers, whether they're cooperatives, um, uh, that, that we can really fortify that uh, infrastructure. And, um, and while the job guarantee has this cyclical effect, that is just the nature of the economy that we have, as we go along to restructure it. But in the meantime, uh, there are people that are constantly trapped in precarious income and employment situations. Uh, I am perfectly comfortable with having a component of the jar and guarantee that's an ongoing component of community gardens, of, of uh, cooperatives that need to exist because they provide so much of the fabric of our communities. And so when you marry that with things like participatory budgeting, uh, with specific design, for example, you could allow path to citizenship through the job guarantee, um, and you bring in the voices uh, of the community. Um, the, the, kind of, the, the kind of design that, uh, that I've talked about has been bottom up, where the community itself actually proposes the projects that they need as they understand best their own needs, um, rather than the federal government. Yeah. Um, just really quickly, and I'll put this to, to all of the panelists. Um, so I think when, when we're talking about raising incomes, um, uh, you know, we, we talk about a floor and sort of like lifting up uh, from the bottom up. Um, I'm actually curious to get your thoughts on how much we need to, to uh, merge this conversation with what we're doing at the top, right? Um, the, the, the ceiling seems very connected to what's happening at the floor. Um, and so, um, you know, Joe mentioned public power uh, earlier. I'm just curious you're thinking about how we can uh, use each of these policies to sort of shift that um, and, and ensure that, that workers are not only getting more in raising their living standards, but also are able to sort of exercise this power, um, public power. Um, so this will only be a partial answer to what feels like a very big question. <laughs> um, this is the last 30 seconds. <laughs> right, right, like just to, but I mean, I do think if we think about the totality um, of an agenda, right, that, that touches the broad sets of things, right? There's a whole, things that we haven't talked about, like how do you make, how do you make a low-income kid have the same um, sense of, of course I can go to college if that's what I want to do, as kids um, in upper middle income high schools, right? Like there's a whole set of things. So I think if we think about the broad agenda, it will take significant resources. And one of the biggest nuts to crack is not actually identifying the needs, which polling will always tell you have actually broad public support, um, but in how you're, but actually in securing the resources to do that, which means convincing the public and dealing with the political economy that it is okay to raise significantly more revenues than we're raising now and to raise them in a progressive way. And so part of the interesting dynamic, right, is that our tax system has become undersized and um, 
and we've done big tax cuts at the top in a world where that actually benefits because of inequality, a very small group of people. And so that is kind of the political nut to crack to sort of secure the public resources through a much more participant and then, and then spend them in a way that is far more democratized um, and that can open up uh, power and opportunity in ways that right now seem kind of very far afield of what we have. Uh, so uh, this question is, uh, most of the policy proposals that have been discussed uh, focus specifically on people who can and want to work, um, uh, aside from the CTC. Uh, what policies need to complement the ones you propose specifically? Uh, what would paid leave policy need to look like? Uh, should caretaking really fit into the CTC? Or should it be dealt with in a separate paid leave uh, piece of legislation? So I can start. So um, I think I'm, I'm really glad for the question. I don't know who asked it, but I was really glad for the question in part because I think we should name a big risk that we have in this conversation, right? We've seen over actually the last, I mean, decades, this conversation about um, not helping people um, and taking away benefits from people who aren't working, right? And then most recently, we've seen it really play out in, in really upsetting and terrifying ways, right? Where we have states saying, I want to take away um, health, I want to take away Medicaid for people who aren't currently working, or I want to take away nutrition assistance from people who can't meet a work requirement. Um, and we know from all the evidence who those, who that would hit and what it would do to poverty and hardship. So it's important to kind of keep in mind as we're creating public jobs, as we're creating these kinds of structures that help workers, that we remember this important group and remember that it's not a, it's not a, it's not a stagnant group. It's not a, that's not quite the right word. It is a group that changes over time. People have different periods in their lives. Um, and sometimes work is possible and, 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 and the best path out of poverty and, and to support their families. And there are always going to be times when people um, may be unable to work or unable to work at a certain kind of level. And so we've got to have a set of policies that recognize that. Um, paid leave is an incredibly important part of that. And it's an area where, um, in so many areas, states are leading the way and showing that actually the sky does not fall. Uh, when we have paid leave policies, and I think that's um, a, a really important policy that can help um, across the income distribution, though generally it helps, you know, it generally it, it, it will leave out a number of people who don't have recent connection to the workforce, right? So remembering the importance of policies and programs that help people when they're unable to work um, for, for a variety of reasons and recognizing um, how poorly um, even well-intentioned, good values, uh, public programs can do at identifying why someone's not working. And so having the ability to step back and saying, there's a basic set of assistance and a basic living standard that we think people in the United States need, even if they aren't able to work, is an incredibly important message to keep, to keep and conversation to keep having so that as we create subsidized jobs, we don't then have the backlash of saying, well, there's a job available for you, so we don't need Medicaid for people who aren't working. Yeah. Um, I think some policies just need to be on their own and not connected to work. You know, Medicare for all, <laughs> universal uh, 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 child care, it, it should not be tied to your job. Um, there are, uh, again, part of this broader safety net that we are re-envisioning and we're trying to design. Um, through the job guarantee, um, because we are providing a base living wage benefit package, there is a way of kind of sneaking these through the back door. This would not be my preferred way of, of doing it, but if you attach, uh, you know, Medicare, to job guarantee, then that's the, the standard for, for jobs. And so there has to be some sort of adjustment and response from the private sector to provide um, uh, uh, health insurance. Um, I should say that in, in our design of the job guarantee, um, child child care is part, you know, professionalized, high quality child care is part of the part of the design. And so again, if you do paid leave, then that becomes the standard for other employment opportunities. That's another way of, of sneaking this uh, through the back door. Um, can I go back to uh, the first question about, uh, about 
resources and inequality, inequality. It's, it is really an enormous pernicious problem that we have uh, and, and more so because those 400 people on the airplane are making decisions about our democracy. And to me, uh, when we tr try to think about how we address the bottom and the top, that's my main concern, that we need to find a way to wield power back and, and money talks. So when I think about um, you know, raising the floor, maybe <laughs> putting a ceiling on the top, I think about what that does to our democracy, not whether uh, we need financial resources from the top to pay for policies at the bottom. Because this is a conversation that always happens only for progressive policies. It's never a conversation that happens for tax cuts, for fighting wars, for bailing out the financial sector. We, we have a public <coughs> purse for that reason alone, because it gives us the the public resources, we have them. If we want to pay for these policies, they're there. The reason why you want to increase your tax system, do many other policies for the top, is just so we can take uh, democratic control back. Yeah, for me, this question, I think, is about how you build um, the institutional power base to be able to have the kinds of public policies that allow the kind of welfare state and the kind of uh, support for, for citizens um, uh, that's necessary. And this goes back to the, the PowerPoint that, um, that Angela was making. Uh, it used to be the case that unions were strong enough, even in the United States, to underpin liberal politics and redistributed programs. Um, they're not anymore. And one of the things that I think we're very interested in and looking at as we sort of see this kind of emerging mosaic of a, of a new democratic economy coming into, into existence is the political potential of creating a new institutional basis for, for politics that then can defend um, the kinds of public policy and the programs that we want to see to supplement some of the institutions that we're talking about. So one in three Americans is a member of a co-op at the moment, if you take into account um, credit unions, if you take into account agricultural co-ops and so on. That's an enormous base to start from. There's also um, 11 million, as I mentioned, um, uh, worker owners, um, which is more than our, our members of unions in, in the private sector. You start looking at some of the interesting things that are done by, um, by local uh, public authorities. Um, Nebraska, every single uh, person uh, and business there receives uh, electricity from either a co-op or a public utility. Um, there's new waves of, of municipal enterprise starting, including with things like broadband. Um, Chattanooga, Tennessee, the fastest internet connection in the country, um, is, is municipal broadband. Um, and so you start to begin to, to see how you can create an economic basis for, uh, for a new politics. And it plays out interestingly in a partisan way. It was, it was very interesting when Obama um, decided that for, because of the ridiculous fiscal rules and accounting that we have, that it was, it was uh, advantageous to consider privatizing the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, just to get its debt off the public books, as if that's something that we care about, Pavlina, right? Um, and, uh, and every single uh, member of Congress and the Senate from that area around the Tennessee Valley mobilized against it, and that was Republicans you know, in a very interesting politically part of the country. So I think you can get some, some, some different politics around some of these institutions. Worker ownership is something that was popular from uh, Ronald Reagan to Jesse Jackson. Um, and so uh, once you've started reconstructing an institutional basis, uh, economically and a politics that can then go on top of that. Lots of other things become possible in what is, after all, still the richest political economy in the history of the world, which is something that we keep forgetting. Um, so this is another question for, for everyone on the panel, and it's a really important one, which is how these policies address uh, marginalized communities and, and acknowledge historical disadvantage and racism and help correct gaps uh, arising from decades of discrimination. I think each of these policies address that in a different way, but, but if each of you could say something about, about that intersection, I think that's, that's a really important uh, intersection we haven't really addressed yet. I mean, I'll, I'll start. Uh, unemployment is concentrated in marginalized communities among young, black and brown communities, uh, uh, the elderly, and so they traditionally experience elevated levels of unemployment, and for you black youth, uh, depression level of unemployment on ongoing basis. And so we have uh, already that, that problematic structural problem that reproduces itself because of the way the labor market works. As I said, the employed get hired first, and um, those with longer tenure in the labor market, the last in and first 
out. The problem is concentrated. There's good empirical work on uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a small segment uh, of the population. So we, we have um, these, these uh, so many challenges that pile on. And when you add to the problem of unemployment, the social cost of unemployment, and all of the other scarring effects, not just in terms of loss of income and experience, the obvious things, but also in terms of increased uh, health, mental, physical health, in terms of the scarring effects on spouses and children, malnutrition, on and on and on. Everything is connected to everything. And so we uh, essentially are really trying to heal uh, this wound that exists in some of those communities and by providing stable, secure, dignified employment with basic benefits is, is that one quick, rapid way of, of, uh, of remedying some of these injustices. Um, also, the policy is targeted. Uh, it is where the people are, where the needs are, and usually communities that have mass unemployment have other social deprivation, and so you essentially address uh, the problems at, at both ends. So at the most basic level, things that push against inequality help reduce racial disparities, but I think that's not enough of an answer. Um, so I think, you know, this, I think what the refundable credits do is it, are, it's a pretty good way of redistributing income. And as I said, that's sort of, that's sort of all it can do. It, it can buffer some um, ups and downs in, in people's financial security, but actually because of its annual nature, um, its ability to buffer is, is more limited. And one of the things about marginalized communities and marginalized fam and families of, of color that is that they don't just have an income gap, they have a wealth gap. And that wealth gap means that they have a cushion gap, right? So, so their ability to weather a period of unemployment is, is, is just financially is less because they have less in savings and all the rest. And so that's you know um, an important thing to think about as you think about um, how policies affect different communities. But I wanted to say a word about immigrants um, because I think Dylan um, raised this really important question about accessibility of any of the things we're talking about um, to immigrants. And one of the things that it really speaks to is th there, there's a question about, you know, ultimately what policy, what eligibility policies will we have for people who are immigrants um, in any policy. And, and every time we go to do an expansion of a, of a benefit program or an income support program or a job or any of those policies, right, um, there is then always this question of like, well, are immigrants going to be included or excluded? Um, and, the, and the policy debate around that has been fraught for decades and decades. But it is most fraught for people who are here without, um, in an undocumented status. And so I think you can't talk about how you buttressed uh, incomes, how you s help stop things like wage theft, how you stop exploitative, exploitative employers without talking about the need for comprehensive immigration reform and getting people out of an undocumented status that puts them in, um, talking about not having power, it is the least powerful position that a worker can have. And so while it's important to have the policies right around um, around eligibility, um, the most important thing is to not have so many people in this incredibly vulnerable uh, legal and power position as, um, as workers. So if you look at this emerging democratic economy that I've been talking about in communities around the United States, um, the, the reason it's been emerging is in many ways um, because of pain and suffering and the withdrawal of the availability of liberal programs on housing and jobs. And that pain has been pushing people to innovate and to take um, matters into their own hands and come up with alternative models of ownership, alternative institutions and approaches. And if you look at who's been doing that, I think it's very interesting from the point of view of marginalized communities and, and immigrants and others. Um, the single largest worker cooperative in the United States is Cooperative Home Care Associates in, in the Bronx in New York, which is thousands of predominantly uh, immigrant women of color um, who work in the home care sector um, and who've been able to take ownership of their own job and control of their own enterprise, um, and, and it's an inspiring story. I think the same is true of many of the other models that we, we look around and point to, uh, the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative, um, our own initiative with the Evergreen Co-ops in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, um, many of the worker owners of which are actually returning citizens who, um, who have not only been able to get um, living wage jobs in, in these new worker co-ops that have been set up, but are on, on paths in, in many cases to um, 
to an ownership stake in, in their company and are building, are building assets. Um, it's possible to do um, very innovative and interesting things in some of the most difficult circumstances uh, uh, around the country. And we've actually, as the Democracy Collaborative, been doing um, some work um, in uh, Native American communities, which are some of the, the poorest and most, most disadvantaged and most disinvested communities um, in, um, in, in, you know, in, the, in, in this hemisphere in many ways. If you look at Haiti, maybe that's comparable to, to many of the stats on, on some of the reservations. Uh, if you look, do an analysis of the spend, you know, there's social security and other things flowing in, but the dollar spends less than 24 hours on the reservation before it leaks out again. And so there's an opportunity there to think about some of these anchor strategies, procurement models, how to connect them to building uh, construction uh, firms so that there can be um, buildings um, and housing um, that, that then can lead to, to finance that um, can allow people to, to start buying their own homes and so on and set off some of these uh, virtuous circles. And so I think um, uh, the, this sort of bottom-up uh, democratic economy is very much being built by people um, at the margins through necessity, through the pain of the neoliberal era, but there's some, some application much more broadly now in the economy that we, you know, we need to learn and, and take from them. I'm just looking at the time. We only have a few more minutes. I want to make sure we get to, to um, as many as we can. Uh, so this, this is somewhat, I think, uh, an offshoot of, of the, the last question I asked. But um, someone asks, a handful of candidates in the upcoming election have considered uh, universal basic income, UBI, as a potential policy uh, for wealth redistribution. Andrew Yang has even gone so far as to shape his campaign on UBI from a value-added tax uh, on tech. Uh, what are your thoughts on UBI? and uh, why do you think it would or would not work in an American economy? Um, so I think the values underlying UBI are many of the same values that underlie the some of the policies and proposals we've talked about today. I think um, for us at the center, one of the concerns about UBI is just whether it it is whether it crowds out. Um, uh, other really important investments that UBI, um, just like the refundable credits alone, can't solve, and whether um, and, and whether the political economy can really would really support that in a way that then wouldn't really restrict our ability to invest in some other really important areas. So the size and scale and scope of that, um, and it, it I think raises some really important questions. Um, I've, I have been a friendly critic of the UBI proposal, and um, I, uh, as I said, um, find the job guarantee complements very well with certain income support programs, but not a universal basic income at level, living wage level for all rich or poor. That's the kind of proposal that I've been criticizing. And um, my one, one of the biggest concerns, I'm just going to highlight, I have a list, uh, is, is that it's a Trojan horse. It, for me, it's a Trojan horse. That it is this idea that so long as I just provide you some sort of cash support, I absolve myself of the responsibility to do all of the other things as a public steward to provide you the public goods and, and services that we require, we need, we have fought for so hard. And even the Andrew Young proposal, which is not that generous, um, gives you there's a little footnote there that you, uh, if you choose it, you have to opt out of your social security. And so there, there is a there you have to really watch. For very carefully how these things are being proposed, who's proposing them. You know, Silicon Valley is very happy to automate away our jobs, but we have things to work on. We have lots of things to do, and uh, UBI um, is not really a solution to, to problems that require a lot of careful thinking, a lot of planning, a lot of design. There's a conference at Oxford just this week um, that some friends were at, and um, one of the papers had the quote that um, uh, asking whether you uh, support UBI or not is very much like asking um, whether you want to bring a feline into your household or not. It matters very much whether you're talking about a tiger or a tabby. Um, and so the sort of design of, of UBI and exactly what function it, it's going to play and how it fits with other things is, is critically important. Personally, I, I haven't reached a view um, on UBI. I think um, uh, the, the reason that it's, um, it's being raised increasingly uh, point to the, you know, some fundamental problems that we've got to, to address. Congressman Kanna was talking about, um, Ro Kanna was talking about 
um, automation um, and jobs and that, and raising this issue of whether we should be all receiving um, uh, income streams from capital, I think, is a really important conversation to be having. There's very different ways to go about designing that and very different relationships uh, between where that stream is coming from and the productive economy that then get into some of these institutional power questions that we've been talking about. But I'm just going to kind of maintain a, a position of, of neutral ambiguity on UBI at the moment. All right. Uh, thank you so much to all of the panelists uh, for participating. Uh, we're going to move into uh, we're going to move into the wrap-up phase. We have some uh, final remarks uh, from Robert uh, and Jeff, and then we'll close. Thank you all. I think it was a great and illuminating discussion. Uh, once again, part, the, there is a kind of bifurcation between is money enough or is money not enough for our poor people. And that just keeps coming up in America. Uh, um, was it Michael Katz who wrote the great The Undeserving Poor book? I bring that up because one of the takeaways from this panel discussion, the most important, is that we really face a political battle in the next administration, whoever is there. And it will run to some degree along these lines. We can't afford progressive policies, and we can't afford to give people money if they're not working. So I think we have to be prepared for a big battle. People will say we don't have enough money. I think this will partly involve tax increases. Thank you again for addressing so many of these problems. Thank the interlocutors. I want to introduce Bob Hockett to wrap this up and summarize. He's a couple of his own ideas. Cornell professor, uh, very active here in Washington, was um, uh, wrote, basically wrote Elizabeth Warren's corporate governance proposal, was key to Ocasio-Cortez's green infrastructure program. I'm leaving some stuff out that he did for Bernie. Uh, uh, he can talk about that if he likes. He's also recently been uh, a co-star with John Cleese in a movie, which I'm not supposed to talk about. I think he plays a professor, but I'm, I'm not sure. So, Bob, thanks very much for wrapping this up, and thank you all for doing such a good job. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks to you, uh, all of you for being here. Um, so I'm just going to provide a, a quick sort of conceptual or analytical map along which you can sort of situate uh, the three basic proposals that we talked about. Uh, and this gives me an opportunity, I think, first of all, to kind of give us a framework within which to think about the proposals and relate them to one another. And it also gives me an opportunity to plug a book that I have coming out later this year uh, from Yale University Press called A Republic of Owners. So basically three simple points, right? I think first, I'm going to characterize the problem that we're faced with in a particular way. Second, I'm going to describe the solution set, right, the set of solutions to that problem and sort of relate them to one another. And then finally, third, I'm going to put a thumb on the scale, sort of in favor of a particular approach, even though I'm very much of the both and uh, school of thought about these. So first, the problem. Uh, I'm going to characterize it in a way that you might not have seen it characterized before. Um, and at first, it sounds like a mouthful, but it's actually pretty simple. The problem, I think, is what we might call income compositional asymmetry or income compositional imbalance. What do I mean by that? If you think of the economy and if you think of the value produced in the economy and the value distributed in the economy as falling into two basic categories, basically returns to capital on the one hand and returns to labor on the other, the long-term problem, and this is not just of the last 40 years, this has basically been the story with respect to, you know, ever since there's been capitalism, and to a degree this was the case even under feudalism, the returns to physical capital, whether it be land capital or machine capital, historically have always vastly outpaced the returns to labor. The latest iteration or the latest version of this claim, of course, is that made by Piketty, the famous R greater than G formula, but that's just a later, a latter day version of what's been a pattern, an historical pattern, for about as long as there has been anything that we might call human economy, right? Now, that's the story, right? The story is one of uh, asymmetry or maldistribution or imbalance. The ideal end state, I would suggest, would be a state of what we might call income compositional symmetry. So let's say, for example, the returns to capital in the economy as a whole, or let's say 90% of the value added is attributable to capital, and let's say 10% is attributable to labor. 
in a circumstance, and I just pulled those numbers out of a hat, those aren't the actual numbers, but if it were 90-10, let's say, then the ideal end state would be one in which every individual received 90% of his or her income from capital and 10% of his or her income from labor, right? In other words, every individual would be a microcosm of that macrocosm, which is the macroeconomy. Two reasons I think this is an ideal end state. Even if we can't quite reach it, it ought to be viewed as an asymptotic ideal that we're constantly approaching. First, sounds injustice, right? Basic fairness. Insofar as capital returns dominate labor returns, we have an inherently unjust or unfair system, at least when you remind yourselves of the role that luck plays in the distribution of capital. Your luck in the birth lottery, your luck in some other lottery, basically an awful large portion of the capital distribution is attributable to luck, not to virtue, not to sort of uh, any sort of personal responsibility on the part of the individual. So the, there's a justice case for symmetry. The second case for it, you can think of as an, uh, you can think of it as an efficiency or stability reason. Think of it as a kind of automatic Keynesianism. When an economy grows over time, there's a certain productive capacity that it has, and it's, of course, acting on that capacity it's producing. In order for the economy not to go into regular crises, its absorptive capacity has to keep pace with its productive capacity. And because the marginal propensity to consume is not evenly distributed across income classes, in other words, because those below the top of the distribution always consume a greater portion of their incomes than do those, do those at the top, a maldistribution of income returns is inherently destabilizing because there's going to be a long-term tendency for the economy's absorptive capacity to fall short of its productive capacity. That's where crises come from. That's even where financial volatility volatility comes from, because much of the financial innovation and much of the sort of friendly eyes cast upon financial innovations by people like Alan Greenspan and others during the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, I think is explicable by reference to a perceived imperative to encourage new forms of consumer debt to get out there to enable those below the top of the distribution to keep consuming, even though their incomes are declining in real terms, and of course to provide new investment vehicles for those up at the top who have already eaten 10 yachts and don't find much marginal utility offered by an 11th yacht, okay? So there's a stability reason then to push for this kind of symmetry as well. All right, so how do we do it? How do we go about trying to reach that ideal end state of income compositional symmetry? Well, there are basically two strategies, maybe three, each corresponding to one of the basic factors of production, right? So you can start with labor and try to raise the returns to labor, or you can look at capital and either lower the relative returns to capital or more widely distribute the capital itself, right? Spread the ownership of capital. Now, you can situate, I think, most public policy proposals, including the three that we sort of focused on today, within that sort of framework, sort of along that map, right? So when it comes to sort of starting with labor to raise the labor share, obvious ways, right? Labor unionization, collective bargaining law that protects the rights of workers to organize in order to enable them collectively to bargain for a larger share, right? To grow the labor labor share. You can view minimum wage laws similarly. You can view uh, the job guarantee, at least in one of its aspects, similarly raise the floor for labor, basically raise returns to labor. There are other reasons to, 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 uh, to support a job guarantee. Um, some of them I propose in a piece that I have coming out in Jeff's journal, a challenge that I call open labor market operations. But basically, when you think in terms of income compositional symmetry, you can think of the JD as a, a raiser of, of the floor. Um, and then and then finally, uh, you can think of the EITC as another sort of raise the labor share sort of proposal. Under the next sort of wing, looking at capital, there are various strategies we've tried over time to lower the capital share or to spread capital more widely. With respect to lowering the capital share, one reading of Keynes, the so-called radical reading of Keynes, is that what he was trying to do was to drive interest rates down to zero, which is essentially to get rid of the returns to unearned capital, basically the euthanasia of the rentier. as. Uh, as Keynes uh, rather colorfully put it. Proposals of that sort can be understood right in that way as achieve
achieving or seeking a kind of income compositional symmetry by lowering the rental returns to capital when a small number of people, comparatively speaking, own all of the capital and indeed are then earning rents on it. As far as the spreading uh, of capital goes, there are lots of proposals along these lines. Uh, Joe is associated with a good many of them. Uh, the great British economist we don't tend to hear about because Keynes sucked up all the oxygen in the room in the 30s and 40s. James Mead, of course, is associated with the idea of a property-owning democracy, same basic idea. Proposals to spread ESOPs uh, or worker co-ops or other sorts of worker ownership or other kinds of constituent ownership, same sort of story. So all of these you can sort of think of as sort of, again, aimed at the, at the asymmetry problem, but from the point of view of not just raising the labor share, but also more widely distributing capital ownership in order then to spread the capital share more equitably. That's the second piece of my little talk. I'm going to close with the third point. I said uh, I'm going to put sort of a finger on the scale or a thumb on the scale. I'm an all of, all of the above sort of guy. I'm a both and sort of guy. As I said, I, I support pretty much everything that we've talked about today. I do think, however, that the spreading of ownership of productive capital in the long run is preferable to the others if we had to choose. And there are three basic reasons. One is there does seem to be a certain psychology that we're all born with. You can think of it as endowment psychology. Its most famous expression is found in the so-called endowment effect in behavioral economics. There's a tendency, once you own something or hold something, to be less willing to part with it. And so you've got that gap, right, the willingness to pay, willingness to accept gap that the behavioral economists started noting. Actually, this was uh, uh, Dick Thaler, a Cornell economist at the time, so I have to plug Cornell while I'm at it here. Um, so there seems to be an endowment psychology effect here. Same thing that leads dogs to lift their legs at fire hydrants, right? You sort of, there's just this tendency to want to own stuff. Second reason is there's a sort of an ideological predisposition, at least in the Anglo-American world, it seems, to favor owning stuff and to favor private law over public law and then within private law to favor property rights over um, uh, so-called liability rights or liability rules. Basic idea here is if you own something and it's your physical property, it's much more difficult for that to be taken away from you or denied you even by centralized action, by public or government action because of the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution here, similar provisions uh, in various uh, English descended constitutions. On the other hand, by contrast, if you have an entitlement that's been legislated in your favor, it's still an entitlement and it's still a property right, but it doesn't have that sort of privileged position that so-called private law property rights tend to have. Uh, and for that very reason, then, ownership spreading solutions tend to be more stable as a legal matter. They tend to be more durable as a legal matter within the legal culture, at least, of the sort of Anglo-American or the English descended world. Final reason, I think, that dovetails with the sort of legal tradition reason is an ideological reason, and that is the sort of civic Republican origins of Anglo-American political thinking and Anglo-American uh, political dispositions. This is the old idea of the Roman Republic, later uh, sort of uh, famously advanced by Machiavelli and Giardicini in the, in the Renaissance period, and then by Lord Bolingbroke and, uh, and, Rich, and was it Herring, what was Harrington's first name? I forgot. It's a Sir or something. Anyway, a lot of uh, interesting 16th and 17th century British thinkers who were sort of neo-civic Republicans, a lot of their way of thinking was brought over here to North America by the British colonists, and that's why you find the word republic all over the place. That's, of course, the, ironically, the one institution that uses the word republic more than any other is the party, the Republican Party that is the least Republican, actually, of all American political organizations. It couldn't be farther from Republican in the, in the classic sense of that word. In any event, that's a sort of ownership privileging ideology as well. But the great thing about the original Republicanism was that it was also egalitarian and contemporary, of course, Republican Party Republicanism is anything but. In any event, for those ideological traditional reasons, legal traditional reasons, and maybe even also, again, for uh, endowment psychological reasons, the ownership spreading solutions to the problem, I think, tend to be more durable, tend to be more promising in the long run. But that, is, again, is not to say that I don't favor the others, all of the above, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, I hope that's a helpful way of situating things. Thanks. Thank you. I want to thank everyone uh, for this great panel. Um, I just was texting with our author, Sam Adler-Bell, that we could have hosted an all-night teach-in um, to really go in-depth uh, on all these issues, but I hope it was 
interesting for everyone uh, and more to come. And thanks for Dylan and Angela for uh, a non enviable job, job of getting at such complex topics in such a short period of time. Um, so please uh, follow us uh, on Twitter and sign up for our email list. We look forward to being in touch with you. Thanks so much for coming.